which means our menu for today is broken up into four parts. Um, start very fundamentally with a definition of the problem and perhaps a good entry point is to discuss the meaning and applicability of what we call the you know, standard private market value approach or well, standard market model if you prefer for those of you who you know have had economics or still deal with uh, economic analysis nowadays uh, there is as you know a very central representation of human behavior and we'll try and see how far it gets us when dealing with languages uh, then we will look at three often heard approaches uh, uh, economic approaches that purport to show that non-dominant languages uh, 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 are valuable. By the way, I've also put this in bold red type because I think that the concept of non-dominance is, I think, the most convenient to use in this respect. I don't want to talk about regional languages or minority languages. Dominated languages, I mean, of course, there is, you know, regional, there is minority, there is dominated. I mean, all these dimensions come to the fore depending on how you look at it, but the concept of non-dominance I find is sort of most useful here and also helps us to focus on what we want to focus on, not get sidetracked in other things. So there are three standard approaches. We'll briefly talk about them and also try to show why, uh, well, they, they are helpful but only up to a point. Okay. And then we will look at a fourth approach which I think is ultimately more powerful, uh, which is to talk about welfare and welfare theory, which is not about welfare checks uh, at all. Welfare in economic analysis means a general theory of well-being, okay? So we'll, we'll get to this. And then from this I'll turn to priorities for further investigation. So let's start with the principle of market allocation. Generally, the basic approach of economic theory is to say that if something is good, and instead of bad, that is, then people will want it. And unless there is downright oppression, physical coercion, etc., in which case economics has very little to say, right? Well, there is, yeah, there are still some niche areas that economics can say something about, even in cases of extreme duress, oppression, coercion, but not much. So we have to move this aside and assume that there is no such thing as downright oppression. And in a, a, a cases where people have a certain degree of choice as to what they want. If people find that something is good, then what they will do is they will express a demand for it. This, you know, and if there is demand, normally supply follows, somehow it follows. Uh, and if there is no supply, then uh, there is, I believe, a very strong presumption that it means demand isn't strong enough. So there is, you know, there is a, a, a supply for uh, uh, cardboard folders, for pens, for clothing, for, you know, books, etc. Books, although it's a slightly different case, but microphones, computers, uh, because there is a supply because there is a demand for it, and this demand is strong enough, is manifest enough. And if something does not exist, a priori it might well be that simply it doesn't exist because people don't want it. The important point there is that this is the result of the uncoordinated uh, interplay of market forces. This is very important because this uncoordinated interplay implies that people, suppliers on the one hand, consumers or buyers on the other hand, uh, somehow get together and mutually agree on what they need without any central authority intervening, i.e. without state intervention. This is the whole philosophy of uh, 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 free market economics, which works very well for tomatoes, clothing, computers, cars, etc. But does it work for linguistic diversity in general? My answer is no, it doesn't. We'll see why. Does it work for bigger languages? Well, up to a point it does, but not really. And does it work for non-dominant languages? In my view, not at all. So we have this paradox that there is a, a, we want to develop an economically based perspective on linguistic diversity, including the role that non-dominant languages play in linguistic diversity, without, at the same time, having to do without the core principle of market allocation. So we have to 
move away from some bits of economics, yet at the same time be able to deploy an economic argument. So uh, <clears throat> let's see at what, at what we have to do this, right? Well, one way of looking at the value of languages is to look the essentially human capital theory. And in human capital theory, you look at language as a skill. So if you speak language J, LJ in this, in this, uh, uh, on this slide, then your wage rate, symbolized by W, will be higher. Therefore, the first derivative is positive for those who remember their calculus. Right? So if this first derivative is positive, not just in a mathematical model, but also if you have data to show this, uh, then you would say, OK, well, language is valuable. So why not? Yeah, that's that's you know, one standard way of, of, of looking at this. So you can estimate net earnings differentials, or what we call rates of return, on the language. And there are many empirical studies on this. However, these empirical studies only take us that far. What do we have? So first of all, we have many empirical studies documenting the value, the rate of return, on the locally dominant language by immigrants. So you have a raft of things about telling you that when Hispanics move to the United States and if they learn English, they benefit from it. Big, big, big surprise. You know, I mean, you know, as, as a non-native speaker of English, when I come to the United States, I realize that if I didn't speak English, things would be a bit more difficult, wouldn't they? Right? So uh, uh, it's not terribly surprising. What else do we have? We have a few results on non-immigrant languages which can mean national languages, for example, in Canada, a country where I've lived for a few years, uh, where you do have evaluations of, rate of rates of return on English and French. Uh, we also have on CH, my country, Switzerland. CH is for Confederatio Helvetica in Latin, because we use a Latin acronym for this, having four national languages. Luxembourg, Ukraine, interestingly, because of uh, Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, also, English, which is not an official language in Switzerland or in Luxembourg. So we have evaluations of the rates of return. Uh, and these rates of return are significant, statistically significant. They're positive. Sometimes they can be very high, which means that such languages as elements of your human capital do carry value in the economic sense. But we have no returns on regional, on various non-dominant languages. No returns, uh, no results on regional or minority languages. Uh, we have only circumstantial evidence that suggests low or non-significant rates of return, sometimes even negative ones. For example, there is one study about the value of Aymara and Quechua in Bolivia, and lo and behold, it seems that the coefficient is negative, i.e., uh, even if you speak Spanish, the very fact that you speak Aymara or, que or Quechua seems to be associated with lower earnings. So some people uh, uh, say, well, this is a golden argument to eradicate Aymara and Quechua. See where it takes us. Right? So we want to be careful when using these kind of materials. Right? Uh, and there is hardly any results on immigrant languages. Some studies have been carried out in Canada and in Switzerland, where we have non-significant rates of return on them. And in Switzerland, we find niche effects, for example, for Turkish. Uh, but these niche effects are, again, very anecdotal. So uh, there is a lot of literature there. It does not help us very much. And why does it not help us very much? In general, because it omits what I would call non-market value. But non-market value, as we will see, is economically relevant. Uh, we will see later what we mean by non-market value. But just to give you a sneak preview of it, think about the value of the environment. Environmental quality is not something that you buy like a microphone, a computer, clothing, or tomatoes. right? It is, nevertheless, economically valuable, which is why we have environmental policies. Right? Another very technical problem has to do with aggregation. Uh, the sum of private values is different from the social value. That's a more technical point. We don't have the time to get into this. Uh, there is also problems of endogeneity, instability over time. Again, slightly more technical aspects that we can return to later if you want.